Okay, good evening to everyone. Um, thank you for uh, being here tonight, either in presence or uh, online. And uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Susanna Tilson, uh, Dea, and uh, Alessandra, because this was something that we put together very much at the last minute uh, in an email exchange between uh, uh, Gianfranco Pasquino and I when we were still trying to guess who uh, the uh, President of the Republic uh, would be. Uh, we will tell you later on who our, our favourites were. Uh, but of course, uh, you know how it ended. Uh, from Mattarella to uh, Mattarella. Uh, he is and remains the 12th uh, President of the Republic of Italy. Unlike Italian governments, uh, the re-election does not mean that he was both the 12th and the 13th president. He remains the 12th president. This means for the second time in less than a decade, we have had the re-election of a uh, president of the uh, Republic. This ha happened also in 2015. Uh, therefore, what once seemed to be a unwritten convention that a president of the Republic should not be uh, re-elected, has seems to have become a convention that often he is uh, re-elected. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of what happened last week, because if you're here, it means you were interested in, in it all, and you followed uh, step by step. And in any, in any case, during the, our conversation, we will be able to touch upon some of the, uh, some of the interesting issues that have, uh, that have come up. Um, Tonight's conversation will be with uh, one of our uh, senior adjunct professors, uh, Professor Gianfranco Pasquino, he, who is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Bologna. Uh, he is also an alumnus of uh, SAIS, spending a year in Bologna and then uh, in Washington. And then, of course, he has taught here for uh, many, uh, uh, many decades. Uh, he had as uh, two of his great mentors, Norberto Bobbio and uh, Giovanni Sartori. Uh, his list of publications is so copious that we would spend from seven to eight just reading those, uh, uh, those publications. Allow me to cite the last uh, publication of 2021, Libertà Inutile, uh, Profilo Ideologico dell'Italia uh, Repubblicana. And last year, and two years ago, I beg your pardon, in 2020, Italian Democracy, How It Works, uh, published with, uh, uh, with uh, Routledge. Um, let me also add on a personal note that I'm very pleased to have this conversation with, uh, uh, with uh, Gianfranco. I've known him for many years. In many respects, I consider him one of my, one of my mentors. We've also been sparring partners on various occasions in the sense that on certain things we see absolutely eye to eye. Uh, on other occasions, we've had interesting uh, debates, uh, including campaigning together during the 2016 referendum on constitutional reform that we may or may not come back to uh, later this evening. Uh, so it's a great pleasure uh, to have you here, Gianfranco, but I mean, we're at Semo Casa qui, so there's not really any issue of, of uh, welcoming you as a, as a guest. So this will be a conversation which will begin with me asking Professor Pasquino uh, a few questions. I will be keeping an eye on the uh, Q&A uh, here uh, online. So anyone who's online, just remember usual rule. Please ask your questions in the, in the Q&A box. And then of course we have quite a uh, audience here as well. So at a certain point I will open up for, I will uh, give the, uh, the, the floor to all of you and you can also ask questions. I think with the idea of wrapping up around eight, 10 past eight, so uh, something quite, quite short, but hopefully of interest to you all. So Gianfranco, the, the first question really is a sort of a general question. What is your, what is your opinion on what happened last uh, uh, last week. What's your sort of overview before we go into some of the details? Okay. First of all, thanks very much, Justin. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to discuss Italian politics and not because it is very important, because it is often very interesting and it provides uh, some food for thought. 
every time. And if you study or interpret Italian politics in a comparative way, you learn a lot about the working of political systems, about the working of parliamentary democracies, about the working of parties and party systems as well, even though parties uh, have declined significantly in the Italian case, but this in itself raises a, a very important question. How can a contemporary democracy work in a satisfactory way when its parties are very weak, declining, no longer representative of large sectors of their society? The second point I want to make is that indeed we were campaigning together in 2016, but on the opposite sides, and I won. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. Okay. Now, uh, um, let's see. This was from the very beginning a difficult election. Because for the first time, the center right had a number of parliamentarians similar to the one that to the ones that the center left had. So there was an equilibrium. They claimed that they had more parliamentarians and that this was giving them the right to, to start the dance, to choose. In fact, someone who decided to take the field, I'm using his own words was Berlusconi, not necessarily fully uh, supported by the center-right, but he was in, indeed fighting not for his life, but his, for his prestige, for his fame, for his uh, ego, I would say. And this in itself affected the entire course of the election, because the center-right could not say no to Berlusconi, and the center-left was somewhat hesitant in saying no, uh, in the end, they decided that uh, the, the reason why they were saying no was because Berlusconi is, uh, this is the adjective they used, the divisive. And from then on, you could reject any candidate by saying he is divisive. Whatever it means, whatever it means, we can discuss devices uh, and if you want. So when the, the voting started, uh, for the first three ballots, you need uh, a three-fourth, uh, a two-third majority, which is very high to reach. Obviously, there was no majority for the first three ballots. Incidentally, some Italian presidents were elected exactly in the fourth ballot when the absolute majority is needed, the absolute majority of those having the right to vote, which meant 505 votes. When they started the fourth ballot, then the candidates appeared. And the, the, the candidates had to be here, okay? But they were immediately rejected because they, they were not constructed, if you can put it this way. There, is a, well, there was no attempt to reach an agreement between the center right and the center left. And uh, the leader of the Lega decided to start the process by, by throwing up, I would say tossing up probably, uh, some names that were obviously not uh, palatable to the center left. Right? I don't know why, why he did that, but he thought sincerely that he was going to win. And again, Salvini has a, an a ego that is a somewhat uh, inflated, I will go this way. He did not succeed. And then, of, of course, the, there were problems within the center, the center right. The center left was still unable to put up any name, but the name of Mattarella, the outgoing uh, president, was being taken into account. It was never, much to my surprise, it was never out of the game. And it was lingering, so to speak, the, the name, Mattarella's name. It was an easy choice. Should I, should I just end here? That's because the, the, then the choice was made. Uh, and uh, should I just add also my reservations, my criticisms? Yeah. 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 So. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I, 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 for, I took Mattarella uh, had his own words. And he had said several times, according to some journalists, he had said 14 times that he was not going to run again, that he did not want to be elected again. Uh, for personal reasons, uh, seven years are long, he is 81, he was tired, personal reasons. And more important, for institutional reasons, not to create another president that the president of the republic can be re-elected. And here there is a nice constitutional issue. 
because the, the election doesn't, the, the, excuse me, the constitution doesn't say anything. It simply says that the president of the Republic is elected for seven years and nothing else. Now, and, and Justin is, a, is an expert on, on constitutions. My interpretation is that, of course, uh, the re-election is possible, but if the constituent fathers did not write anything, it meant that they preferably would have uh, suggested to reach a situation in which the president is not re-elected. There is one other element in the constitution that leads me to this kind of conclusion, that the president cannot dissolve parliament in the last six months of the life of the parliament. And that was very clear, the very clear message sent by those who wrote the constitution, that he, could, he should not manipulate that parliament, and he should not try to get a better parliament uh, with new elections. In this particular case, just imagine a center-right president knowing that the center-right has indeed a majority in, in the next parliament that this can be discussed. It could have show, uh, decided to dissolve parliament. So my point of view is that the president should not be elected, that the spirit of the constitution says, no, you should not be re-elected. The second element is that when you re-elect the president in this, in this way, by the way, with more votes than when he was elected the first time, it is a sort of, I can I say a sort of, uh, just suggest me a word. It's, it's a sort of plebiscite, plebiscite, which I don't like. Uh, and since we, in the past, we have uh, a very interesting event when Mussolini signed the Concordat with the Italian church, uh, a very famous cardinal said that Mussolini was the man of the providence. And since I do not believe in men of the president and not in women of the president, this is a, a bad situation. There is, Mattarella now has been sort of crowned and this is not good. It signals two things that I do not like. First of all, that we need that specific man. And in any case, we need one man or perhaps two if that if then we discuss the, the government, uh, be, Draghi being the other one, uh, to solve the, the crisis, the problems, I would say, and that we indeed have a crisis, a systemic crisis. Do we? I don't know. I, I put it this way. I would say no, but then I would discuss this at length. Thank you, Gianfranco. You've mentioned Draghi, and I think this is a very important issue. We've had complicated presidential elections in the past, 20 or more rounds of, of voting and so on and so forth. But my impression is that what really made this presidential election complicated was the fact that one of the favorites for the Quirinale was Mario Draghi, incumbent prime minister. And therefore we found ourselves in this very complicated situation where parliament was not only having to, uh, to elect a president of the Republic, but also had to contemplate whether to cause a government crisis and there, therefore also to evaluate whether there was a possibility of then forming another government and ending the parliamentary term in 2023. That I think uh, caused um, quite a lot of quite a lot quite a lot of problems from a from a political point of view and I would hazard to say almost also from an institutional point of view. Yes. Uh... All former presidents were elected when they were no longer very active in Italian politics. And no previous prime minister, as such, in office was elected to the presidency. Because it is not true that prime ministers cannot be elected to the presidency. In fact, Seni, 1962, had been a prime minister before being elected president of the Republic, but not when he was elected. In fact, Cossiga had been a prime minister, but not when he was elected. Ciampi, Ciampi had been a prime minister, but not when he was elected. I, I could add, because I know that the man is a rumor. Napoletano would have been, would have liked to be a prime minister, but he, he was not, but then he was elected once and then re-elected for, for another couple of years. So there was this kind of curious, strange, somewhat uh, I mean, somewhat difficult situation. What do we do, do we do if we elect Draghi? That is, what happens? There is a crisis of government. Uh, by the way, the prime minister is appointed by the president of the Republic. So you have Draghi who leaves office as prime minister, becomes president of the Republic, 
there is obviously no no prime minister and Draghi himself will appoint the prime minister this is a very nice complicated constitutional issue on which i would defer to you but there was one other problem that is Draghi had let uh, uh, Draghi has made two major mistakes he had let known or in, or in any case he had not denied his intention to be followed by someone whom he liked or whom he likes that is in fact he was saying that he was going to appoint the prime minister another member of the team of non-politicians within the government and you can imagine obviously party leaders being not very happy with the fact that another politician non-politician will become a prime minister first mistake the second mistake is, is that it was he was visibly aiming at the office of president of the republic and this uh, was somewhat resented by several party leaders uh, several parliamentarians as well that is he had declared himself a grandfather at the service of the institutions uh, which meant to just promote me and then he is thriving on this kind of major wave of prestige authoritativeness uh, this doesn't work uh, some that is everybody likes Draghi Draghi is necessary the Financial Times was supporting Draghi the Wall Street Journal uh, the, the the Germans uh, and and so on and this was again this is that's what say a minor or not so minor interference in Italian politics presented by uh, the, those provincial Italian politicians uh, and, and and this obviously played in the end against Draghi. The final step was also interesting that apparently, as the story is told by the journalists, it was Draghi himself who went to Mattarella and said, you are to become prime minister, uh, president of the Republic, because there is a crisis going on, uh, we will not solve the problem and so on, which is something he should not have done, in my opinion. Great. Yeah, very good point. Okay. Let me put it this way. We've been reading the newspapers. You yourself mentioned the crisis of, of Italy's political parties. And of course, Italy isn't the only country with a, with a crisis of, 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 of the political parties. But let me put it, let me put it another way as a kind of fan of parliamentary, of the parliamentary form of government. Could we actually say that this was a case where the members of parliament, the so-called grand electors, deputies, senators, and delegates of the regions actually acted with a bottom-up process, which led to the election of, uh, of Mattarella, with all the reserves that you've, you've, uh, uh, you've underlined about having a president re-elected. But could we say that this was the, the triumph of, uh, uh, of parliamentary democracy, or is this Frazzini just being very romantic about it? And the truth of the matter is that but Mattarella was the easy fix, and that makes sure that they stay in office for another year, and that way they will be able to draw their pension, okay, looking at it from a completely cynical point of view. Well, if I have to choose between the romantic Frosini and the cynical Frosini, I would choose the romantic one. <laughs> but I'm not so sure that this was correct. Uh, there is obviously many parliamentarians wanted to solve the problem. And, and apparently that was the only solution available because not, no other solution was really being taken into consideration. But there were at least two other solutions. And I think we, we should discuss the two, the two other possible Absolutely, candidates. Yeah. One was Giuliano Mato, who, by the way, was obviously a former prime minister, a very capable man, a, a very important professor of constitutional law, a former socialist, uh, to, to his discredit, he is often accused of having been the the second hand or the the second hand, the best hand uh, supporting Craxi and making the government by Craxi possible and viable and indeed some also functioning working okay and uh, Giuliano Mato is is a, is an excellent man and he would have been a very good president of the republic the other one was uh, the other one whose name was circulating and and I think was taken into consideration was Pier Ferdinando Casini, Bolognese, the member of parliament since 18, 1983, a former Christian Democrat, uh, not especially prestigious, but someone who knows Italian politics, who knows the institutions, who knows the parliamentarians. He does not have a, a major visibility at the European level, 
But on the other hand, he was the, the president of the Christian Democratic Federation for some yeah, time, right. of the International Christian Democratic Federation. He was the, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. He was elected by, he was also a former speaker of the House of Deputies. He was elected by Berlusconi, the center right, but he is at this point in time, he sits in parliament as a senator elected in the center of Bologna by the Democratic Party, or put up as a candidate by the Democratic Party, and then elected in the center of Bologna as a senator. Uh, I, I, I should put it this way. I voted for the other candidate and the other candidate won, but he won too because the, the electoral system is a, is a curious mixture of majority and, and proportionality. Casini is an knowledgeable man. And I would, would also say he is not preposterous. He is not someone who is willing to impose his will. He is someone who knows, uh, who knows uh, how to make Italian politics and to make the institutions work. Uh, they uh, they were never voted, uh, they were never put to vote, and therefore we do not know what the parliamentarians really wanted. I think that in the end, the Mattarella was the easy choice, and uh, not so much in order to survive for another 10 months in office, uh, but because uh, they could not find another, another possibility, and they were, in fact, destroying uh, possible candidates. Uh, and so I would say probably the English would be for he was elected by default. Okay, I know you've, uh, and then we'll open up to the floor. I see there are also some questions in the in the Q and A box. I know you've just finished the, your grading for political systems of the developing world, but I want you to uh, do another type of grading now and looking at the political leaders, regardless of whether we can say this was a revolt of the, of the backbenchers of the so-called peones and so on and so forth. Who comes out of this looking the worst and who comes out of this looking more solid politically in terms of the, of the main uh, political actors, including Draghi? Grading is always a very difficult job, and I, if, the, if there are some students of mine in, the, in this classroom, let me let me tell you, it is very painful. It is very painful because I know that grades are important for you, uh, but I have to to I can I say to grade in, again in a comparative way. So uh, uh, also when grading, I also you are, I'm also grading myself. Because if you are not good as, as students, it means that I was not good as professor. So grading is painful. Not when I grade the politicians, however, I'm, <laughs> I'm somewhat happy when I can grade the politicians. Now, the worst one was, was by all means, uh, Matteo Salvini. Matteo Salvini was definitely the worst ones. He wanted to be, again, uh, you, you said grand electors, but would you say really grand electors? No, no you shouldn't. They were the, not grand. They were small and yeah, I agree with you. Okay. Absolutely. And, but the Italian, the Italian word used by the journalists, uh, who are usually not particularly well prepared when it comes to, the, to explaining the constitution and uh, analyzing the subtleties and so on, the implications and so on, was that Salvini was wanted to become the kingmaker. Now, why should you uh, identify someone as a kingmaker when you are trying to elect the president of the republic? I don't know. Okay. In any case, Savini was not a kingmaker uh, because he, he really had one object. He, he was that was, um, I mean, not germane to the presidential elections. He wanted to show that he is better than Giorgia Meloni, okay? because his his uh, competition now is within the centre right, and Giorgia Meloni continues to increase the votes for Fratelli d'Italia, and Salvini continues to lose some votes. And this is a tough situation because they had agreed some time ago that the one who has, who has more votes will claim the office of prime minister. So he was not really fighting in order to elect a good president, but fighting in order to, to, to prove that he is more important, more capable than Giorgia Meloni. The worst possible uh, fight and, and the worst possible result. It, it, it is clear that, that Mattarella was not Salvini's first choice. Right? Okay, the, the worst one, uh, the best one. The best one, I don't know, I must say. That, because I would say that if it, if it is like winning and losing, there is someone who has not lost. And there's someone who has not lost is, is certainly Giorgia Meloni. 
she has not lost and she has proved twice that she is capable of choosing good candidates. Uh, she put up a, a member of the Fratelli d'Italia team uh, who got twice the number of, of, of votes uh, the parliamentarians of Fratelli d'Italia have. And then uh, when the, the other, all the others were voting, Mattarella decided to put up a judge, a judge whom I do not like, I think he is a reactionary, but this is not a problem because once more she got twice the votes of Fratelli d'Italia. So she proved capable of identifying candidates, and by the way, the two candidates have a definitely larger following in society than one would expect. But the point is that he, he, she cannot say that she has won. Uh, so I would say she uh, retained her position uh, and, and she can be relatively satisfied, I will put it this way. And I, I would also add, if Justin allows me to say so, that I would say that Mattarella has not won. I would probably say that he has lost her because he said things that he is unable now to, uh, to what can I say, to implement. And, and Draghi has not won. And in a way he has lost. I, I would say the President of the Republic now is weaker than in the first term and Draghi himself is weaker. Uh, because and both depend on each other to some extent, Mattarella less so because the president is in office for seven years, no matter what. But Draghi depends a lot on Mattarella, and more than in, in the previous situation, he had acquired while governing a stature of his own, and now he needs the president. Allow me to take a, a question that's in the uh, in the Q and Q and A online because it connects to what we were saying. Uh, Mark Gilbert asks, why did the PD play Catanaccio rather than Im imitate Guardiola and Gasparini and try pressing? <laughs> now, I know there, there's no, a little bit of the football no. metaphor. Yeah, well, I understand the metaphor, but I, I wonder what, you know who Gasparini is. Right, Gasparini yeah. is the trainer, I think. Uh, this is the English word That's right. for the football Manager. team Atalanta. Yeah. Atalanta is the football team of a small town, Bergamo, uh, who is the, that is doing very well. And Gasparini is an excellent trainer. Uh, um, um, the PD is not a small <laughs> team. It's supposed to be a, la a relatively uh, solid team. And not so. It's divided into different factions, I would say, with the three different leaders in addition to the secretary. And one of the three leaders was, in fact, in the run, I would say. The Minister of Culture, who is a very decent man and a very capable politician, was in the run. Okay? Uh, but his name was never Franceschini. But his name was, was never put up. So let them, in fact, played Catenaccio, as, as uh, Mark Hilbert said. But I do translate Catenaccio for those... Uh, Playing in Play defense, defensively, but, very okay. defensively. Yeah. He was always asked uh, for a name and he never never gave an answer. Okay, And I think that Mattarella was not his first choice. But on the other hand, he, could, he, he had no solution to the problem of choosing a prime minister. So in the end, he accepted the outcome, but he cannot claim credit for, for the outcome. So you cannot win a game in which you need personalities if you do not put up the name of a personality. Sure. So it definitely has not won. Okay. Right, let's open up to the floor here. Anyone going to break the ice? Use your rule, say your name and where you're from, please. Okay. Uh, nice Alec, loud voice. Yeah, Alec from Chicago. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, so the question that I have, I know that uh, during this whole process, a lot of schisms within the center right have been opened up, both between parties, Maloney and Salvini kind of competing for hegemony over the center right, also within parties between Giorgetti and Salvini. And Salvini a few days ago in some interview, kind of staking out the future of Lega said that he wants to make it like the Republican Party in the United States. I want to know kind of what does that mean? What is he referring to? Is it the, the Republican Party of Trump, of Bush? And then also, why is there this compulsion within Italian politics to always refer when trying to make Italy a normal country to refer to the Italian, right? PD people do this as well, to make the PD like the Democratic Party of Obama, where it seems like given the, the kind of currents happening in the United States, that's my, maybe not the normative example that you want to want to be making. 
Well, let me let me say first of all that we have some nostalgia for Mayor Daly, who is capable of controlling the elections in a decent way, and and therefore he could would have probably found uh, a, a good candidate in the in the first uh, two or three ballots. Uh, I don't know. This is a, a question that it is important. I don't know from where the fascination with American politics come. But I know that this, the idea that you should imitate American political parties comes from the, from the Democrats, from the, the former communist and the former Christian Democrats, when they study the idea, and in, in more precisely for, from the supporters and collaborators of Romano Prodi, because the first uh, uh, splinter group created by Romano Prodi and his collaborators was called the Lasinello, the donkey. So they were trying to imitate uh, the, the Democrats in the US. Uh, the, it, it, I, I, I simply think it is absurd to believe that the, the Lega, the um, Georgia Meloni and Berlusconi could create a Republican party in this country. And you are right, which Republican party? By the way, uh, not just Trump, uh, and Bush, perhaps Lincoln should be called into the picture. I would be very happy if they were capable of creating a party, uh, the party of Lincoln. It is absurd. There is a, just, they are just uh, kind of kicking the ball very far away. And then uh, they decide, they, they also say that the, the Republican party is a, is a federated party, a federated party. They probably do not know the importance of money for the U.S. Republican Party, the importance of the evangelical church and other elements that I'm not going to explain to you. Uh, let me put this way, it is a preposterous idea. Just it is being uh, swallowed by Italian journalists who know nothing about American politics. Absolutely. I would also add that they would have a branding... Excuse me, excuse me for my, uh, how do you say, uh, euphemisms. <laughs> They would, also have, they would also have a branding problem, Gianfranco, because there is a Italian Republican Party, mm -hmm. a very yeah. noble party okay. from the from the First Republic, uh, La Malfa, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So um, let me combine a couple of questions that I've had online. Maureen Christensen says, does Italy have a fundamental leadership problem? Are there any great European leaders left? De Gaulle, Thatcher, De Gasperi? And I'll add to that a second question by Mark Gilbert. Where are the 60-something-year-olds? Um, there doesn't seem to be the generation of a sort of group that should sort of uh, replace the ones that are in power now. The Mattarellas, the Draghis, where are they? Well, Casini is 65, yeah. so he would probably belong to this category. And the they, political careers usually take a long time in this country. Uh, because nobody really go, nobody really is defeated and therefore obliged to leave. Uh, but but it is correct. There is this, the, those in the, their sixties are not there. Uh, even though one should not forget that Salvini is forty seven, if I'm not mistaken, and Giorgia Meloni is uh, forty three, uh, and she always uh, uh, tells us that she has nothing to do with fascism because she was born in no, uh, nineteen seventy five. So it is not forty seven uh, already. Uh, which obviously it is not a very good uh, way to show your distance from fascism. Okay. Uh, no, Italian, Italians from time to time find some leaders. One, uh, that is one of them. But if you look at the way the European authorities have uh, showed their emotions when uh, the president of the, of the European Parliament, uh, David Sassoli, died, David Sassoli had acquired a visibility, appreciation, um, prestige at the European level. And apparently Gentiloli as well, the Italian com commissioner, is, is uh, widely considered a, a, very, a very good man. On the other hand, I mean, do we find important leaders today at the European level? Uh, obviously not. That is, Germany has a problem with leaders. Uh, Macron is, uh, is visible only because he is in fact president of the Fran French Republic, but not because he is particularly capable. Uh, I, am I going to discuss Boris Johnson as a great leader? No, don't, please, 
I would have some difficulty. Uh, and, and, and probably the, the last leader we, we really liked, uh, Louis, in the center of the, the, the year, was Tony Blair. He was a leader, but now we know that he also made choices we, we, we have not liked. Uh, and the other one who was famous for a while was a Greek, a Tsipras, yes. uh, were, were capable, but again, and at this point, Europe does, doesn't does have great political leaders. Uh, should I say that the president of the U.S. is a great political leader? No, I'm not going to say that, even though I will be trying to have a low profile on this. But the point is, it can be extended, because do we have great European intellectuals at this point? I mean, probably the most important one remains uh, Jürgen Habermas, who is, if I'm not mistaken, 93. Uh, someone may say that Piketty is uh, is uh, okay, growing in stature, but again, not yet a, a great intellectual leader. Okay, I think Andrea, we had here. Anyone else? Just put your hands up. Okay, there well, at the front. Good evening. My name is Andrea. I'm from Rome, and I had a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned uh, Napolitano. I want to know from you if you consider feasible. Uh, Napolitano, Napolitano style scenario with Mattarella resigning in a couple of years and Draghi stepping in as the president. Second question, you mentioned the clash between Salvini and Meloni. I want to know if the decision by Salvini to stay in the Draghi's government that played a role in subtracting votes to the Lega. And where do you locate Matteo Renzi in the future of Italian politics? Very briefly. <laughs> If I have to, to discuss my theories, I have to move slightly away from, <laughs> from Justin. <laughs> well, I would say that, that Mattarella should not resign before the end of his term. Uh, other, otherwise, he would have played a very a, a game I wouldn't like. Okay? That is, he has to serve his term as uh, seven years. This He was re-elected full stop. Uh, uh, tomorrow he will deliver the, the inaugural speech. I, I'm very curious to see what he, to, to listen to what he, he is going to say. But Napolitano was, I know Napolitano very well. Incidentally, from that time I was uh, uh, saying that I would have liked to see a president whom I can call with the two. I can call Mas Mattarella two, um, Casini, Draghi, and Giuliano Matazuela. So in a way I won. That is, uh, is someone whom I, to okay. And Napolitano was really going away, was was outgoing, had decided to go. I, 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 and in fact, we were discussing this, when you are no longer president of the party, would you like to come to, to Bologna to give a couple of classes to the, to the Bologna Center? But incidentally, Napolitano speaks very good English, very good English. Uh, and and it was available, okay? so he was obliged to stay. But if you uh, are interested in uh, in important documents, you should read the speech he delivered to Parliament when he was re-elected. He was chastising them without, uh, I mean, pitilessly. Yeah, okay. yeah. Wow. Uh, I'm. I'm. And this explains why I'm cu very curious about uh, uh, what uh, Mattarella would say. Your, your second question was. Yeah, and this is also, no. if I may, Eleanor, Eleanor Caprioni also asked about the future of the centre-right alliance. Well, Salvini, is there going to be a split between Salvini and Meloni? Salvini was uh, was very much interested in, in re-entering the government, in becoming again Minister of the Interior. But he's a very controversial, he has been very controversial, uh, not just in Italy, but also abroad. Uh, at the European, uh, in, in the European institutions. Uh, Meloni is... Uh, I, I I know that she wouldn't like this, but but Meloni is, a, is an interesting person, incidentally, and she is a real politician. Meloni's future is Marine Le Pen's future. That is, you are you have twenty percent of the vote, twenty two percent of the vote, and you never make it because you are there. That is, the, you occupy the extreme right, and there is no way you can get into a government if you are situated there. Not in the French situation, also because of the of the electoral system, eh? and the way you elect the president of the republic, the way you elect parliamentarians, but not in Italian case. And incidentally, the present government is exactly a government in which are all political parties but Giorgia Meloni. 
Okay, before giving the floor, I think we have another question. But before that, you mentioned the magic words, the electoral system. All of this election of the of the of the president of the republic has reignited yet again a discussion in Italy about reforming the electoral system. And you and I know that this is discussed just as much as who should be the next manager of the Italian football team. So my question to you would be, okay, uh, the, the, the Rosatellum, I think we can both say, is an awful uh, electoral system. It's not the only awful electoral system we have had, but would it, is it preferable to reform that system? And if, if we do, what direction should we go then? Should we go towards a majoritarian two-round voting system, which I think probably is your preference, or should we go towards PR with a threshold of 5%? Yeah. So okay. Similar to the Germans. I'm going, I'm going to take a vote on this. Do you really want to know about the Italian electoral system? Raise your hand. <laughs> It is one of those, those esoteric debates that, that can go on for, for a long period of time, <laughs> uh, occupy your time, and in, in the end, you will not get anything really tangible, useful. <laughs> but let me try, let me try. Incidentally, I just published an article on the Italian electoral law in two, today's newspaper that is called Domani, and I received a phone call from the vice secretary of the of the Democratic Party, saying he started by saying, "I mean, not I have not said that. This is not my, my position. And so, on. why do you criticize me?" And I say, "Wait a moment. What kind of art, a, a scholarly article have you read on electoral systems? Because this is the test. If you want to, to talk or, or, or about the Italian electoral system, you ought to know something." Okay, all right. Um, I, I just make some important points. <laughs> this way. The first one is that Sergio Mattarella wrote the law that was used in 1994, 1996, 2001, and that worked yes. in the sense that he provided representation to the Italian voters, to the Italian electorate. Okay? That Mattarella law, Mattarellum, was a definitely a rather good law, not not perfect, because there is nothing perfect, even less obvious in Italian politics, but it was a very good law. It was a very good law also because it was the product of a popular referendum. And so it was not the, pro the, pro the product of some dealings uh, among politicians. Then there was a law written by the center right uh, that was explicitly written in order to, uh, to produce a victory for the center right, and it worked. It worked. And when the, the center left won, it won a very razor thin majority, exactly because the law had been written in order to prevent the center left from winning that law. Then there was an, an attempt to, to introduce an electoral law by Justin's friend Matteo Renzi. It was a very bad law, very bad, but in case it was defeated together with the referendum. Okay. Now uh, we have this kind of law, incidentally, Rosato is the, the author of the law, is, is a member of Matteo, uh, Matteo Renzi's splinter group. Uh, again, the law was made in order to prevent a victory of the, of the Five Stars movement. Uh, obviously, it didn't work. And indeed, it provided more seats for the Five Star Movement. Uh, now I know, and I, I hope you, you know as well, on it, in case you can buttress my opinion, that the, in Parliament, they've already succeeded in draft, redraft, redistricting, uh, redrafting the, the various elements so that the law can work even with the, with the, with the yes. reduced number yeah. of parliamentarians. Yes. Yes. If this is the case, they are not going to change anything. They, 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 will, they will not find the, an agreement on other electoral systems. There is the, the electoral system I prefer that is the, the, the French electoral system has no chance, eh? even though it is officially in the program of the Democratic Party, but no one of them has ever argued the case for the French electoral system. And re, uh, re, returning to proportional representation, what, what, what do you say returning? This, the, 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 the law uh, drafted by Rosato is in fact, 
two thirds proportion or one one third major, majority. So you should not say returning. In any case, there are very good uh, proportion electoral laws, uh, starting with the German ones. But the German ones, and not the German, and then you change it here and there. You reduce uh, the the threshold for party for parliamentary representation and so on. And since I do not trust uh, Italian uh, electoral reformers. Uh, I think that we are probably going to vote with the uh, Rosato law, and, and and it will be a mess, which is very good for Pasquino, the political scientist. It is very bad for Pasquino, the citizen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Ethan. I come from Chicago in the US. Um, Chicago? Yes. Well, just outside. I fake it. But um, <laughs> yes. Um, my question, uh, kind of going off of the great leaders of Europe question earlier, what do you think that this election has, uh, what is what effect is this election going to have on Italian soft power and forward policy objectives more broadly? Uh, Italy arguably had a really good 2021, its economy is doing uh, quite well. Uh, it's handling COVID better than most, even its sports and pop culture did quite well. And so it seems like so much is going well for Italy right now. And it seemed that the timing of this election uh, can really predict the future of its soft power, of its foreign policy. I know that the presidency has a bit more hands-off role in its uh, economic future, but, and so maybe this question is more pertinent to who is prime minister next year. But I guess, what uh, do you think that this uh, election result is going to have on, on its soft power, its foreign policy more broadly? Well, according to the reactions of the of the foreign press, they are happy with the results. Uh, they were worried, uh, and I understand them. I understand they were worried about instability, which is which is something that Italy provides uh, very often. Okay? In this particular case, there, there will be stability, stability in the presidency, stability in the, in the government. So in uh, in Brussels, apparently they celebrated all this, but it is stability at a price. That is, we have not solved the problem. That is, they, they are in a way buttress in the system. Okay, but the crisis, the crisis, the difficulties, the problems are still there. So they will, will be there at the end of, of Matarella's term, but it will be a very difficult situation. And they will be there in March two, 2023 when uh, parliamentary elections are held. So we hope that Draghi and his team are capable of uh, making all the reforms necessary to implement uh, the uh, next generation UE plan. We got a tremendous amount of money, and if, if, if it is capable, uh, by the way, let me say so that my evaluation of Draghi as a prime minister is obviously positive, and also my evaluation of Mattarella as president is positive. I'm only uh, uh, criticizing this kind of game they play. I do, I do not like it, those games played by the politicians and even by the non-politicians. So the situation apparently is relatively good. And here there is another element that everybody says, it, uh, Italians do the, uh, show their best part when there is an emergency. Okay? And apparently there is still an emergency. Italians work a lot, especially when they work for themselves and not for the state. Okay, so they they make a, they, they they can in in fact make the economy uh, run even in 2022 and probably beginning of 2023. The problem is if the politicians are going to to introduce some uh, I can I say some most of course because they because of their. Uh, electoral campaigning. I, I hope that they are not starting, going to start the electoral campaign now, that is, uh, but they, they wait until 2023, because electoral campaigns obviously affect, would affect negatively the working of the government. And the economy is doing rather well, uh, apparently better than any other European economy at this point. Okay, are there any other questions here? Okay, we've got a question online by Maria Marcic. Uh, from the library. And the question is, what happened with the Casa Belloni? And who was responsible for her being bruciata? Uh, was she on the PD's list uh, of candidates? And again, Mark Gilbert with his third question, will there ever be a woman president that connected? So it looked on Friday evening as though we were about to have the first female president in, this, in Italy's history. 
We've never had a female prime minister either, by the way. What happened Friday night? I am, I am in this difficult situation in which I obviously have political ideas. I don't know if I'm divisive or not, but both Justin and Maria are partisan. They are partisan for the Partido Democratico. Uh, and I am in the area, okay? But I do not like the way the Partido Democratico is run, is managed, and so on. So I usually I'm criticizing the Partido Democratico. And Maria and uh, Justin look at me in a very, uh, can I say, very um, critical way, I would this way, okay? All right. Uh, I challenge the, 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 the women parliamentarians uh, saying, look, for the first time, you are 330. You are always uh, 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 always complaining that no woman is taken uh, uh, into consideration and so on. Why don't you join and propose one name? Because again, this is the problem. It is not enough to say that I should be a woman, President del Pavi. Just give me the name, the name. Why don't you uh, discuss and produce a name that was First of all, silence, and those who were not silent say Pasquino, the usual uh, provocation from Pasquino. Yes, it was a provocation, but I mean, try, at least try. Incidentally, Giorgia Meloni is a woman. She never thought for a moment to, pro, to pro, put forward uh, the name of, of a woman. But they, and, and again, they should have challenged her to participate in the game and producing the name of a the woman. There will be a woman in the future, I don't know, but, uh, but again, if you want to be a candidate, you have to show that you want yeah. to be a candidate, okay? Uh, incidentally, and on this again, I have a, a fair amount of experience in Italian politics as well. There, in 1999, together with uh, the former secretary of the radical party, together with Alessandra Mussolini, the granddaughter of Benito Mussolini, and several other parliamentarians, I don't remember all the names, but it was an interesting group. We, pro we started a committee supporting Emma Bonino for president. It was exactly Emma for president. Okay? And the, the, can I say, the support for Emma was growing in society. It was a, an interesting situation. The, the journalists were reporting what we were saying and so on. And at, at that point, it was so clear that there was, in, in fact, this kind of wave of support that, that Walter Veltroni decided to counteract immediately. And he, he drafted a, a sort of a, a list of requirements to be a good president. And he supported Ciampi. And in the end, he succeeded in electing Ciampi. But uh, the consequences of the Emma for president a campaign it was that in the European elections of June 1999, the radical party got nine yeah, percent right. of the votes. Okay, so there is still space or for politics. If you want to pay a price, of course, you have to engage in some activities. Emma Bonino would have been a very good candidate. Of course, she would have not won for obvious reasons because she is very much for European incidentally very much liked by the Europeans but she is uh, let me say to say the least anti-clerical and therefore the, the Catholics would have uh, uh, amassed a series of, uh, of, of ammunitions against Emma Bonino and she is she knows the constitution very well and uh, she is not a feminist but uh, on the other hand she has always fought all the feminist battles well in advance of Italian feminism she was a good candidate but unfortunately she is not in good health and so she she was no longer a possible candidate okay I think we have time for one last question there isn't anyone is there anyone from the audience Okay, well, let me ask the last question very quickly. There are one or two people in my my uh, constitutional development and democratization class that will rem remember me saying, when we have the week of the uh, Italian presidential elections, by the end of the week, we will have one or more politicians saying, this should be the last time the president is elected this way. The next time it should be a popular election and I was proved right yet again it always happens so let me throw the ball over to Gianfranco and ask you this question has the time come for Italy to 
reform its uh, and uh, change its form of government and introduce direct election, which of course I and almost anticipating what you're going to say, should it merely be changing the system and ele and directly electing the president, but nothing else, which you already know what my opinion is of that. I have great reservations. Or should we go the whole way and adopt a French-style semi-presidential system? Well, both uh, Giorgia Meloni and Salvini have said that they are in favor of presidentialism. Uh, presidentialism doesn't mean anything in itself. Because there is a presidentialism in the US, there is presidentialism in told in Brazil. There is presidentialism in France as well. One should not forget, by the way, uh, that the left has won a significant, the Socialist Party has won a significant electoral victory in, in Portugal. And in Portugal, there is a semi presidentialism. Okay? The president is directly elected by the voters. And at this point, incidentally, the president is a, a member of the Social Democratic Party, that is the center right party. And the prime minister is, is the leader of the Socialist Party. And there is a semi presidentialism in some uh, uh, other countries as well. For instance, but this is slightly more difficult to define. In Finland, there is semi presidentialism, but it is a weak semi presidentialism. There is an, at least one other country in which you elect the president directly, and it is Austria. And Austria is a parliamentary republic. So, in fact, you can elect a president. There is also, because I see someone in the audience that wrote a paper on this, is also Ireland. Ireland, yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. Ireland, yes. yes. Uh, uh, but they are not the presidents no. with the executive powers. But once you change the constitution and you elect the president in Italy, the expectation of, uh, uh, directly by the, the voters, the expectation of the voters is that he, he will have power. I mean, if you elect the president, you want him to have power. In fact, there will be a, an election in which the, it will be the president against the parties. We want you because we do not want them. And this was, would create a very difficult situation. So in principle, I'm in favor of having a semi-presidential republic. Uh, I would not accept to have just a president elected, just a game that, that we played, that we play. And, and, and now the, result are, the results are not, are not so clear, but let me tell you that we would not like to have Bolsonaro. We would not like to have Trump. And we would not like to have Berlusconi, but again, uh, this is these are my political opinions, but uh, Berlusconi would have been a very good candidate for the direct popular election. And again, if Berlusconi is the candidate of the center right, where is the candidate of the left of the center left? This would have been a significant problem for later to solve. So um, let me put this way again: as a political scientist, it would be very interesting to see what happens. Of course. As a citizen, I'd rather not. <laughs> Do you know something, Gianfranco? I agree with you on that one. <laughs> Gianfranco Pasquino, thank you very much for uh, this uh, conversation. And I think you will all join me in giving him a round of applause. Thank you very much.